listening to Development Works, produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Hello, friends. I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works for February 20th, 2016. And on today's Upcast... Payments are made and students are set to begin their medical education again this March. Brian is entering his fourth year of medical school in Nicaragua, and Kimberly is entering her third year of medical school. Our team is set to go. So we've sent in our charitable application to the CRA now, and we should actually hear back from them regarding our status in about four to six months. So thank you so much to all who helped out with that. We are currently hiring a lot of major positions with this organization. Human resources is certainly on the move in DFD. And lastly here, we have had our first program's event, so thank you so much Sharifa for coming out and giving us an enlightening talk on epidemiology in today's context, with current references to why the subject matters. Updates for the week. Now over in programs, policy and applied research, an announcement for those who haven't heard. Elizabeth, our health policy manager, has moved on from her role to deal with some personal and work-related commitments. Now, she was incredible to have on the team, and we really appreciated her contributions to our health policy vision. So, Elizabeth, you will be greatly missed, and thank you so much for all of your hard work. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And uh, lastly over here, payments for our students have been transferred to FAJB. That is the foundation of Gene Brueger. It's our partner organization in Nicaragua. So we had a difficult realization when, because of interest rate changes, our payments for students actually have increased by about 40%. So when you hear about the pros and cons of exchange rates, we are definitely on the con side of that coin. Now for everyone's interest, our payments are made in six month chunks for our students. We take the half now, half later approach. So from there, our local intermediaries, FAJB, distribute the funds to our schools and to our students upon checking in with them every month. So Mike, I am very happy we could definitely make those payments now, but what about the ones coming up in six months? Well, thank you for asking, Andrew. We don't actually have uh, the funds uh, and enough money to make the next same set of payments for our students. Uh Uh-oh. Well, that means we'll have to shift focus onto fundraising soon so we can get some medical doctors through their beautiful educations. (laughs) That was so dry. Um, Mike here, the Director of Canadian Operations. So, in general in operations, uh, the work hangover from the AGM in January has finally subsided. And everyone is getting back down to work. So I would like to personally thank everyone who has been putting in tons of work into their roles in the last few weeks. In particular in ops, I really want to give a special shout out to Ed and Amanda who have been working their butts off with our massive hiring kick. So thank you to them. In strategic operations, and that includes HR, finance, and legal. Speaking of hiring kicks, Eduardo, the manager of HR, is back with a vengeance and hiring his team. That includes a recruiter. And warm welcome to uh, Lisa and thanks. Uh, And he is also hiring an HR assistant and volunteer engagement specialist to help with all the processes and details that come with hiring. As an organization, we are hiring fundraising managers, uh, events team staff, legal systems managers, Spanish translators, an IT specialist, grants managers, and uh, lead nurse volunteers. So all in all, we're looking to fill about 10 key roles in the next month and a half. So if you're hearing this and you think to yourself, self, I may know someone who has some mad skills and may like to help with one of these roles. Uh, Please send us their contacts. Over in outreach on the Canadian operations side, this includes communications, events, and community groups. The nursing community has met a few times and now has a set number of roles for each member. And this is a big development. So they, they as a team, developed a, a set core values. Uh, and I wanted to share them with you here. So Nurses for Nurses works respectfully and sustainably with Nicaragua. They work for accessible and sustainable healthcare in Nicaragua. They empower Nicaraguan nurses through needs-based programming. They support health education in Nicaragua and build the international development knowledge base in Canadian nursing communities. And they are a transparent, constructive, and fun professional nursing community. Over in events, uh, we just hired Nashima as the events manager, who will be building a great events team up in the coming months. And finally, in communications, Carol, the director of communications, has been hard at work building her team, and we are happy to say that we are this close, as I pinch my fingers together, 
to having two Spanish translators to help us build connections to local partners and also do more outreach to Spanish-speaking communities. Also in communications, Kieran has been starting work on storyboarding our new website. That'll be released later this summer. And Jalal has helped the comms team with back-end planning by building task lists uh, to increase mechanisms for accountability. Finally, in communications, we wanted to do an extra special mention to a very special volunteer. Now, this volunteer seems to weather the storms of work and of change and continue doing amazing work, no matter what the situation. Now, that volunteer is Talini, so our, spo uh, our social media master. And don't just take it from us. I have a friend, personally, who is director of a major international nonprofit, and this is true, who said, quote, who is running your Facebook? I am jealous of your Facebook. So in true Andrew form, here is a song just for you, Talini. Once upon a time, there was a person who had mad skills and taught us all a lesson that being a consistent volunteer means the most. So when you get a note and you see that Facebook post, we say thank you. And over to Andrew for his Founders Update. Thanks, Mike. So I'm settled into my new job in the city now and all seems to be going well. I'm also getting excited to start fundraising again. It's been a while since I have. And I think that the more people that we can tell our story to, the more money we will get to support them. Our students have incredibly powerful stories. So one of our students worked on a farm for hours every day, took care of his family, and got great grades in high school before going to medical school. Another one of our students became inspired to be a doctor and work in rural areas after having open heart surgery as a child, and that saved their life. I feel we will have some more, uh, much more support for our students the more we tell their stories. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on coming up soon. For our main story today, Sharifa's talk on epidemiology is pulling together some very important concepts. Let's listen in here. Let's talk Zika. The mosquitoes that, um, that transmit Zika virus also transmit malaria, also transmit dengue, also transmit chikungunya. Mosquitoes virus. are the problem. Yeah. Mosquitoes, mosquitoes are the most lethal animal mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. I think What's El Salvador put, uh, uh, the government proposed a two-year ban on women getting pregnant. I think that's what's the problem in the countries. Okay, Zika virus. This is what we know. So Zika virus was first identified in Uganda um, in 1947 in monkeys. And then later in 1952 in humans, um, both in Uganda and in Tanzania. Um, primary transmission is through the bite of an infected mosquito. Okay? Um, it is rare but there can be mother-to-child transmission of Zika at the time of delivery, um, and then also during pregnancy. Okay? But we don't know how. We don't know how that occurs. Um, there have been reports of sexual transmission and through blood transfusions, um, and that's also being investigated. We also know that one in five will become ill. But ill is, it's a term that's, I would say, someone with Ebola virus is ill. So the symptoms are very um, common, they're very mild. They usually last up to a week. Um, Zika virus remains in the blood for approximately seven days. And again, they're looking at the link between um, blood transfusion. The symptoms are very similar to dengue and chikungunya, and it's spread through the same mosquitoes as was mentioned earlier. We also know that there's no vaccine for prevention. There's no curative treatment. Um, and prevention is usually done by just avoiding mosquito bites as normally would be done. And symptoms are just treated, um, take some Advil. As of now, there are 28 countries that have reported um, Zika virus, including Nicaragua. And when we look at the number of people that are affected, um, there are about 125,000 suspected cases. Suspected meaning people have gone to the doctor with the symptoms. Um, the number of confirmed cases is about 2,500. Confirmed meaning lab confirmed we found the virus in your blood. You have Zika virus. There have been 12 deaths due to Zika virus. All right, so what we don't know about Zika, we don't know a lot about Zika. There have been no um, reported outbreaks of Zika virus prior to 2007. And we don't know the epidemiological characteristics of Zika virus. What is different? Um, we know that it's, tr it, um, it's transmitted by mosquitoes, but why does it only affect pregnant women or 
potentially, theoretically affect pregnant women? Um, why does everyone else get very mild symptoms? Um, is it an urban versus rural um, characteristic that we are missing? Is it a gender characteristic that we're missing? Is it a socioeconomic status link that we're missing? Which, um, interestingly, um, there is a link um, to um, women who have um, cases or who have children who have microcephaly and where they live and how much they make. So there, that, that link exists. We don't know how to link it back to Zika. Okay? Um, we don't have any medical countermeasures. Um, we don't know how Zika interacts with other mosquito-borne viruses. And that can be very important given that the same mosquitoes um, transmit dengue um, and other viruses. And we also um, don't have any lab diagnostic tests, aside from the blood test. With Zika, there is no outbreak that predates 2007. We don't know how it reacts um, in, or how it interacts with um, different variables of descriptive epi. And so we need to do analytic studies to, um, to understand how the disease works, right? So there have been observations of a correlation between uh, microcephaly cases um, increasing at the same time as um, Zika virus cases. So that is something that's being studied. There is no causal link right now that says that the Zika virus causes microcephaly. That does not exist. There's a correlation, but there is no cause, which is why doing analytic studies is very important at this point. Um, microcephaly is a condition where baby is born with a small head. Um, it's usually rare, um, and it's, uh, it can be caused through a combination of viruses we don't know what triggers it. And the most reliable way to assess whether um, a baby has microcephaly is after it's born, which has an impact on um, the family planning choices of women, right? Okay, and then uh, Brazil has reported an unusual sudden increase in babies born with microcephaly since May of 2015. Okay, now I'm putting this map up because I think it's important um, uh, this is a map of the legality of abortion in these countries. So I mentioned that um, the most accurate way to assess microcephaly is after a baby is born. There's a major challenge that exists. If there's a link between Zika and microcephaly, how will governments react? Um, um, how will governments change or not change the legality of abortion in their countries? And reminders for the week, our next in-person meeting for the whole organization is Sunday, March 6th at 4 p.m. in the Overground Lair. That's at 545 Sherburne Street. These meetings are not compulsory, unless you're being asked to speak about a particular decision that must be made. With this new form of opt-yourself-in meetings, we're hoping to not waste anyone's time, like is often done so, so many times in volunteer organizations. But that being said, if you are a social creature, or if you want to learn more, or you want to be in a leadership position with DFDNFN one day, it's really important you come to these meetings. I, for example, am a very social person, and I want to see all of your pretty faces, so please come on out and spend some time. Secondly, we are doing a trip to Nicaragua. This is for real this time. About five of us so far have confirmed that we are heading down in July for a week with the final dates to be released soon. So keep a head up for that announcement and all volunteers are welcome to come out. Should be costing about 12 to $1,500 for a week to 10 days and start practicing to Espanol. Thanks, Mike. And just to introduce some new volunteers, welcome to the organization Nishima over in events, who's taking over for our events manager position. And thank you, Lisa, who is our new recruiter in human resources, working hard with Ed. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. This is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. You're listening to Development Works, produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses.
Hello friends, I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works for March 8th, 2016. And on today's Upcast... Humber, the college, not the river, is going to potentially be a long-term partner for the Research Ethics Board for internships for financial cooperation, we hope. And our new HR team is oriented and ready to go, so thank you so much to Eduardo and Lisa for putting together great people dedicated to bringing on and keeping on fantastic volunteers within DFD and NFN hashtag volunteer retention. We are hiring. Uh, that's our life these days uh, in the director slots. Uh, a lot of tracking down of candidates, interviewing them, and training them to be fantastic in their roles. And we seriously need to lay out exactly what Nurses for Nurses is within the organization. Now, I know there's been differing opinions about this for some time now, but after our last Executive Council meeting this past Sunday, we've come to a very important and thorough understanding on how NFN fits into the organization and how it will help DFD and NFN. Updates for the week. Now, over in Programs, Policy, and Applied Research, our students are alive and well and thundering along in school, so Brian is in his fourth year, and Kimberly is well into her third year now of schooling. Now, Paul, our manager of impact assessment, otherwise known as monitoring and evaluations or many other synonyms, is finalizing the Radio Health Project details before its launch, which is scheduled for T-minus sometime soon, maybe. Over in data sciences, Anna Simic is slowly handing off her role as manager to Renita, who is currently working with Bo to develop a future plan for data work and on to programs, and specifically to finding a programs manager. Well, because of our extremely high standards, it is taking us a long time to find that special someone. And I know the HR team of Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses has done everything just shy of building a profile on OkCupid to look for our next programs manager, but we blaze on to find the right fit in the pursuit of someone truly great for our hearts. Mike here, the Director of Canadian Operations. So generally in operations, we're building a strong partnership with Humber College uh, as our work falls directly in their mandate. From the fundraising program at Humber to the marketing program, our international development program, there are so many ways that we can work with their students and professors. And we're currently in talks to set up something more formal. Uh, they're looking for applied research opportunities for both students and faculty. And that's why this partnership is like jelly to our peanut butter. I like to think they are big enough as a partner that this is a really big deal, yet uh, they're small enough that I can go to someone's office to meet with them in person. And the other big news in uh, operations is that we've almost hired grant managers, and these folks are going to be helping us support our students by securing funds from all sorts of avenues. Over in strategic operations, and this includes HR, finance, and legal, Amanda, the director of strategic ops, has been looking for an IT person to help us sort out all our technical needs. So if you know a tech whiz, please send them our way. And Jessica, the Director of Legal Affairs for Operations, has put in place the plan to bring on a program-specific lawyer and expand our list of supporters. The HR team, led by Ed, has been amazing these last couple weeks. We can't thank him enough. And we now have a five-person strong team in HR that will allow us to hire up to 10 people at once. Over in outreach, this includes communications, events, and community groups. The nursing community continues to grow in number and scope, and we were able to discuss the context of NFN at the last board meeting. So each nurse who is part of our organization is finding a work group to work within, like fundraising or events or research, and they'll develop a specialty there, but more on this later. The University Student Club at UTSC is setting up a bank account as we speak and has official club status on campus. Woo. They're going to do great work laying the foundations of what is to come. And what is to come, I have no idea. So we should really <laughs> ask them. And let's do that next time, Andrew. Um, in events, Nishima, the events manager, is building her team. That's her main focus for the next two months. So we'll be finding other amazing people to help us run all of our events. And over in communications, direct... Carol, the Director of Communications, has been moving forward with expansion of the team, and we're looking to synchronize more with our PAPAR counterparts, that's Programs, Policy, and Applied Research, and Carol is looking for someone to bring more of the research and programs stories alive in our communications, and that someone will be hired soon. Over in fundraising, this is a bit frustrating to talk about, as we didn't have enough money to cover our students for the last payment, and I personally uh, covered them for about $5,000. Thank you. Uh, and we uh, got to this point of financial insufficiency, um, but uh, how we got there is, is tough. But here are the reasons, uh, the top reasons, according to Mike, me. 
First of all, uh, we tried to hire some fundraisers last year, and they didn't work out twice. We actually tried to hire them two different times. And it seems like it's hard to find people to do something for free that most people don't like doing, that they could get paid to do. Weird. Hmm. Uh, there were some more complications. So volunteers uh, who could start to build fundraising relationships or do some fundraising calls for us, their time is inconsistent. Uh, things like our parent charity, GPN, made asking for money difficult uh, to explain to donors because of that strange structure of having a parent charity. We also found that no one cares about Nicaragua. Um, our network was small, and that was really difficult and expanding. But that's why part of our, our new strategy was to expand our volunteer base. That would, that would expand our connections and our ability to fundraise. So instead of traditional fundraising... We actually tried to focus on small-scale informal funding sources to get us through these first few years, like the Rotary Club, or like education-based scholarships, or a couple private donors, or like one or two low-hanging corporations, all of which have not been able to uh, come through. We haven't been able to seal the deal with them for a year now. So if anyone out there cares about our students staying in school and wants to help us improve our fundraising, please let me know. Get in touch. You're more than welcome to help. And over to F Andrew for his fun founder's update. Now, Mike, I'm still spending most of my time dealing with the trials and tribulations of fundraising. And I really do feel that Salesforce should seriously gamify making fundraising calls. How many fundraising calls did you make today and how's sales going, Andrew? Well, I made enough to keep my plants alive and my daisy farm is absolutely killing it. So yeah, I'm ahead in sales. I wish I could say that more often. <laughs> now, I also had another fun orientation this past Sunday, and I really do look forward to welcoming three great new volunteers on board. I'm also really grateful that the orientation, uh, that we have a full recording of it. This allows us to get volunteers caught up in a much quicker basis if need be. And um, good feedback on it so far, too, from the volunteers that have watched it. And thank you very much, HR, for the great idea. And for our main story tonight, Nurses for Nurses. So why are we called doctors for doctors and nurses for nurses, Mike? I don't know. Well, the original premise for doctors... You really should know. <laughs> you really should. <laughs> the original premise for director. doctors for doctors came from the idea that doctors for doctors here wanted to support... Uh, the doctors here wanted to support doctors in Nicaragua through education and afterwards through supporting their outreach to their rural communities. And for more or less, that's what we're doing now with doctors for doctors. Now, in nurses for nurses... It was identified as an essential step forwards three years ago because nurses are going to be a huge part of our on-the-ground work in Nicaragua in how we support healthcare in Nicaraguan communities. Now, we also wanted to build a community of nurses here that was dedicated to fundraising for the nurses in Nicaragua. And that's exactly what, Mike, you've done. And uh, very grateful for that. So with that, we have nurses that will exist in the organization throughout all of its departments. Now, they will form a committee of nurses that has a unique agenda to expand that awareness around what we're doing and their networks of nurses here in Toronto. So why is this a good idea? Well, for one, no one wants to reinvent the wheel. We have so many resources with DFD and NFN that for nurses to build their own team and build their own brand separately just doesn't make any sense. Two, this will heavily mitigate our risk in Nicaragua. So we have all of our projects and ideas developed as a full programs team, and we have everyone weigh in on that, which has nurses on the team as part of the nursing committee. Now, we will therefore have one unified programs policy and applied research team, and this is essential from what I've seen overseas in all the programs that work. Now, in three, this allows the nurses who volunteer with DFD and NFN to have a committee that they fundraise through, that they develop ideas through, and develop personal and professional connections through. So if this works well, and we really do think it will, we may carry it on to chiropractors, other student groups, medical students, pre-medical students, other doctors, um, may form their own committees within the organization. And with these structural decisions, uh, we are making choices that are going to benefit the nurses that are volunteering with us now, as well as the nurses that we're gonna work with in Nicaragua. Now, a very dedicated nurse, Catherine, who was out at our executive council meeting this past Sunday to discuss this issue, definitely has some words to say on this matter. My name is Kathy Menelese, and I'm a nurse volunteer for Doctors for Doctors, Nurses for Nurses. 
I love nursing from everything we do to what we stand for. And as a nurse, I really just want to make a mark by trying to improve the quality of lives of anyone I come across. The nursing group for Doctors for Doctors, Nurses for Nurses are hoping to gain a deeper insight into the nursing communities that exist in Nicaragua and help build meaning and capacity through the use of strategic evidence-based research to increase quality and sustainable access to healthcare and education in all regions of Nicaragua. Reminders for the week. Our next in-person meeting of the whole organization is Sunday, April 3rd at 4 p.m. in the Overground Lair. That's at 545 Sherburn Street. Uh, again, these meetings are not compulsory unless you need to get approval for something in your work group. But even so, we would love to see you, so come on out. We are going on a fun, non-worky trip to Nicaragua. June 30th to July 10th, and put it in your calendars now this year. It should cost about $1,200 to $1,500 total, with possibilities for extensions on that date, either before or after. The purpose for this is to have fun in an incredibly beautiful country. Surfing, beaching, eating gallo pinto every day, and of course, uh, the lakes and volcanoes in Nicaragua are to be expected. And finally, uh, on Saturday, March 19th, from 2 till 3 p.m., there will be a presentation on management skills. Learn how to very effectively manage others in life, and this includes, but is not limited, to managing in DFD-NFN. Now, introducing new volunteers, welcome to the organization Irene, who's over in our Spanish Communications. Uh, and will be helping us out with our Spanish website content. Now Jessica and Rose in HR are coming on as well, so thank you so much for that. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. And this is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you don't make my stakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. Listening to Development Works, produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Hello, friends. I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works for April 17th, 2016. And on today's upcast, we are going to Nicaragua. Today, we're covering what a charity needs to get done on the ground to foster growth and set things up for the future year. Who's involved, uh, what we will be doing. And what are the specific objectives? Uh, this will be highlighted later on. And the nursing community is often doing great things. So we're meeting once every two weeks and we have our plans sorted out. And our current objective is set, trying to find and connect with nurses in Nicaragua and help them help their communities, driving sustainable change to Nicaraguan healthcare. Bo over in Programs Policy and Applied Research, or PAPAR, has a team. Programs is now fully set up and operating with full steam ahead. And in fundraising, including corporate social responsibility and grants, it's also fully up and running. So watch out, world. We're going to be getting sustainable sources of funding, which means here we come. Updates for the week. Now over in programs, policy, and applied research. Let's get started with programs. I'd like to introduce you to our two new members. Catherine will be working with us as our programs manager. She's got great higher level experience with management of both staff on the ground and programs. She's worked in Nepal and Indonesia, and she is absolutely great at what she does. Now, she'll also be working with another new member, Rodrigo, a fluent Spanish-speaking, cultural context-knowing programs planning lens, who is also dedicated to the success of the project. So welcome to the team, you two, and thank you so much for working with us to make sure our programs on the ground are always giving as much as they possibly can. And in data sciences, Renita, the data manager, says that we plan to focus on two goals this year. So the first, having an, interact an interactive map of Nicaragua that can show multi-layer data. And two, measuring physical accessibility to healthcare services across Nicaragua so we know where to go next. That's a mouthful. Over in monitoring and evaluations, Paul says that we have four new research agendas, and they've been formalized this weekend with three in nursing and one in the maternal and child health research streams. So they're in the process of being sent for review. And Paul also has new research coordinators, and both were provided their first assignments. So thank you very much, Programs Policy and Applied Research. You're doing great work. And they sound so smart, don't they? Mike here, uh, the Director of Canadian Operations. Generally, in operations, uh, we're doing pretty damn amazing. Uh, DFD, NFN. Um, in strategic operations, and this includes HR, finance, and legal, 
uh, in HR, the HR manager Ed and his team are doing an incredible job supporting our organization's growth. We brought on nearly 20 people in two months, and we couldn't have done it without the support of HR. So thank you so much. Our legal team is expanding, and we are finding more lawyers to help answer all of our questions. Now, what this is actually doing is we're developing a roster of friendly lawyers who wouldn't mind answering a question or two a month. And that way, they help us on their terms. They don't get overwhelmed, but we still get all the benefits of their expertise. Over an outreach, and this includes communications, events, and community groups, the nursing community is now meeting twice a month to discuss best practices in international development. Everyone is so excited about this newfound structure, and hopefully it helps rally more nurses to join NFN. We want to become the hub for all nurses in Canada who want to learn more about development overseas. In events, the events manager Nishima is trying to use her previous expertise to host a fashion show where all the proceeds go to us. Anyone interested in fashion or shows or the collective impact of both of those words uh, should get in touch with us. And over in communications, uh, we're still looking to do some hiring to support our web redesign and social media strategies and a bunch of different aspects. Finally, on fundraising development, and this section has been frustrating for so long, and today is no different. Just kidding! We found amazing people and created fundraising systems and reorganized the structures and we have direction and motivation. So shout outs to Tay and Michelle for joining the fundraising team, doing the CSR. A uh, special mention to Mike Cohen, uh, who just keeps showing up in a good way, uh, just consistently. So thanks to him. Um, and so brief synopsis here on the fundraising development. Uh, the plan is to have a volunteer fundraising team or teams set up by the end of May, and we will be blast calling corporations for money by June. We also have our grants team set up and running, and they have about five people, and they're going to start uh, cranking out applications for money by the end of April. Great work, guys. And over to Andrew for his founder's update. Well, everyone, I'm doing really, really well these days on the DFD and NFN front. I actually just got back from a really great meeting with a potential funder for all of our female students, and boy golly, did that go well. Uh, I guess it's easy when our vision aligns perfectly with the vision of other smart and successful foundations. And I know this is going to be really great for our student Kimberly, but also our future female students as well. So, woohoo! And for our main story tonight, let's throw it to Andrew to explain everything you need to know about our trip to Nicaragua in July 2016. So if you didn't already know, we're going to Nicaragua from July 1st to 10th, and we are inviting all volunteers to come. Now, what does this trip look like? Let's start with the operational details. So we're leaving from Toronto Friday, July 1st in the morning, and we're arriving in Managua, that's the capital of Nicaragua, that night. We come back Sunday, July 10th, arriving in Toronto in the late evening. Now the whole trip should cost around $1,200 per person, with the flight being around $800 and the travel and accommodation being about $400. Now if you want to buy a bunch of stuff or can't stay in hostels, it's probably going to cost a little bit more. Uh, now, what's the deal with money, you ask? All transactions in Nicaragua can be made with U.S. dollars or their local Cordobas. But having a small denomination of U.S. dollars is the way to go. Also, you need to buy a visa at the border, so having about $20 USD in cash is essential. With respect to vaccines, you really only need the standard hepatitis A and typhoid. Now, malaria is present, but it's a very, very low risk in the areas that we are going to go. So neither Mike or myself will be taking malaria medications, but I would say definitely speak to a travel medical doctor in the next week or so to get yourself all taken care of if you are coming. Special equipment, well, you really don't need any. A camera, sunscreen, good walking shoes, that's about it. So what are we going to do when we're down there? Well, we're going to Nicaragua for three core reasons. So first is to solidify connections. So that's with partners, students, and also between volunteers. The second is to collect information. So that's with new students, but also our old students. We, got, we want to get really, really good at telling their stories, understanding what they're up to on the day to day. Uh, and that's developing connections with them, collecting photos and video. And the third is to fall in love with this beautiful country and culture that we work so hard to support. In order to get all of these things accomplished, the general itinerary is as follows. So Saturday and Sunday are spent in the capital, that's Managua. And we're going to meet up with Rotary Clubs, our other partners, CM8M, hospitals, and the public university. 
We're also going to explore the city and meet friends and contacts. From Monday to Thursday, we'll be heading down to San Juan del Sur, where the surf is beautiful, to meet with potential funders and our partner uh, of the Jean Brueger Foundation. Now, we'll also meet with our students and their families in the area and just to be able to better tell their stories, like I mentioned uh, before. And from Friday to Saturday, we'll also head up to Metagalpa, this new region a little bit more rural in Nicaragua, to be able to meet our potential students and establish new connections with potential partners in the region. So that's all the work stuff, but we're also planning to go to the beautiful island volcano Omotepe for a day and have lots of time on the beach. Also, if you're looking for a low-key trip or some surfing, you're more than welcome to opt out of one of the sections of work and you can go and explore. You can also stay afterwards and continue to hang out in Nicaragua, and we already know at least two volunteers who are doing just that. So if you really want to see what we're all about, please join us in Nicaragua. It is, at the end of the day, the place and the people that we're all doing this great work for. Reminders for the week. Our next in-person meeting for the whole organization is Sunday, May 1st at 4 p.m. That's 545 Sherburne Street. Uh, these meetings are a great way to connect with other volunteers and hear about the decisions that have to be made in the organization. And secondly, if you're just tuning in now for some reason, uh, the Nicaragua trip. We're going down uh, to Nicaragua July 1st to 10th. We're buying those tickets this week. So please let us know if you do want to come. And introducing new volunteers, welcome to the organization Catherine and Rodrigo in programs, as mentioned before. Tay and Michelle in fundraising, thank you, thank you, thank you. Adil, a new grants volunteer. Christy, a new nurse within the nursing community who's doing great stuff. And Garnett, a legal coordinator with Jessica. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. And this is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, si no cometer errors, que no está trabajando en suficientes problemas difíciles. I like my voice there. It was good. <laughs> I am Andrew. Si no cometer errors, que no está trabajando en suficientes problemas difíciles. <laughs>
and the rest of their team is uh, dealing with a huge number of applicants for several volunteers uh, and volunteer roles that we're looking to fill. Rumor has it from that team that we had over 60 applications in two days come for only one of those positions. So I don't even want to know how many applications they have to deal with. Thank you to HR. Our legal team uh, just submitted our bylaws to the Canadian government and is also working on a formal tax submission from last year. Over an outreach, this includes communications, events, and community groups. Uh, the nursing community continues to grow, and the two meetings a month model that we've been working with uh, is working well. So NFN will be the place for nurses in Canada to learn about international development. In communications, we're still overhauling the whole team structure, uh, so we're asking for patience on that for anybody waiting for some communications. Uh, and thanks to Jalal and Lisa for working that out. Also, a special shout out to Kieran, we mentioned earlier, a web designer and a good friend uh, for starting us along this long road to getting a new website in place. Thank you. Over in fundraising development, Tay, the director of fundraising, and Michelle on the fundraising team have posted the job descriptions for fundraisers and fundraising managers. Uh, and the fundraising team is on track for, for being full steam ahead by June 1st. By the way, if anybody knows any fundraisers or fundraising managers, uh, please send them over. And special thanks to our grants team as well, Will and Adil, uh, supported by Amanda here, uh, who worked their butts off and got a grant out last week on a tight deadline. It was awesome to see, so thanks uh, so much to them. It's the first of many to come. And over to Andrew for his Founders Update. Well... Thank you, Mike. No problem. I had a great meeting with a director at Humber for a potential teaching job or involvement in their international development project. So this is huge because it's a good partnership for us to formalize and definitely part of our direction for building communities oriented towards creating positive change here in Toronto. So as this partnership grows and grows, I mean, what founder wouldn't be excited? Can you imagine getting taught by Andrew at Humber? I well, can. If you do, you can't? No, I, I could. I guess. <laughs> And for our main story tonight, let's throw it to Andrew to explain how we are going to spend money that isn't already allocated to programs. Thanks. So as our structure grows, we will obtain more funding for operational costs. And we have to expand on the ground here in Canada so we can expand on the ground there in Nicaragua. Now here is how our funding will be distributed. So picture this. An organization gives us $10,000 of funds for operational costs. What do we do with all of that money? Well, firstly, they have to go to cover any expense that occurred in getting those costs in the first place. So this is something every charity has to deal with, with things like online platforms, Canada Helps, or money transfer fees, that kind of thing. That's small, it's probably going to be with every donation like that, and it'll just get out of the way right off of the top. Now the second thing is, the money is going to go to cover ongoing minimum operational costs. So. This is basically the bare minimum that we need to function as an organization. So these are things like our website fees or meeting software so we can actually meet as a team. These are our essentials so we can continue to build what this is. Now the third thing that money is going to be going to is ensuring that nobody has any personal costs and our charity doesn't have any debts to either to our students or to our local partners. We want to get those out of the way. Now the fourth thing is once all of that is paid off and we're in this more secure place, we can begin what's called our reserve fund. So from here on in, 50% of all money coming in will go into setting up this reserve fund. And once we have enough in the account, we can actually use that money uh, and put it into an investing fund where that money can continue to generate uh, essentially more money that we get to figure out what to do with later. Love money. Love when a little bit of money becomes more money. Mm -hmm. Now, the fifth thing where money is going to be going after we start get to build up that uh, reserve fund is we will get into a space where we can start to pay volunteer expenses. So these are things like transportation, meetings, or trips for programs as needed. And lastly, as we start to pay off those things, we can start to reinvest in our growth. So these are uh, growth operational costs. So things like uh, an easy example is just printing brochures to hand out to people. Um, so for us to better advertise or fundraise through that. So note that paying a volunteer stipends or salaries, uh, these are not on the list. And this is because as an organization, we have to get our act together and we have to put us in a financially safe place first um, before we can start to grow with more salaried, uh, salaried positions. 
So this was approved today. The structure was approved that I just went through. Uh, and it may change a little as we move forward, but the general structure should remain. And this is the best way for us to take our money and make it count. Reminders for the week. Our next in-person meeting for the whole organization is Sunday, June 5th at 4 p.m. at 545 Sherburne Street in Toronto, Ontario, for those who are international. We're bringing in a new structure, which will include a lot more discussion and group participation. So we're looking forward to that. And second reminder, our Nicaragua trip, if you didn't already know, we're going down to, Jul uh, to Nicaragua July 1st to 10th. And super happy to have Julia, Michelle, Taylor, and Kathy coming with Andrew and myself. Really looking forward to that. So much. Now, introducing new volunteers. Welcome to the team, Edgardo. So he will be taking, uh, he will be working with Renita in data sciences. Thanks for coming to the orientation. It was great to meet you, and I look forward to talking again soon. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. And this is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. That's it. Oh, that's it. Listening to Development Works, produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Hello, friends. I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works for May 21st, 2016. And on today's upcast. Have you ever been to a Tau before? That's a Terra Part the Organization event. Do you know what it is? Uh, well, a brief explanation is coming up after the update. And over recruitment in Papar is currently looking for world-renowned researchers as our research team gets more formal and builds on previous successes. Grants is going to be working more closely with Papar. Bo is helping to redesign the workflow of the Grants team and more coming on that later. And for a main story tonight, we will be owning some pretty important inefficiencies and miscommunications within DFD and NFN these past couple of months. And it ought to be fun. Updates for the week. Now let's get started in programs, policy, and applied research. So over in programs, Catherine and her team have been pouring focus into writing up program design and implementation documents for the medical scholarship program. Now in data sciences, Renita says that she's speaking with Ed from HR and heard about all of the analytics needs in the HR department. So she'll log this as a project idea and would like to take it as a future project. Also, Renita had a talk with Paul about integrating data science projects with research projects conducted by the Monitoring, Evaluations, and Learning team. On top of that, she's currently writing a proposal for the use of Twitter data to support the Maternal Adolescent Pregnancy Research Project. Now that is something I find exciting. And we all know that young pregnant women in Nicaragua face many challenges, from finding healthcare to ensuring that they have all of the vitamins needed for a healthy baby. And of course, if complications arise during pregnancy, as sometimes, unfortunately, they inevitably do, things can go downhill pretty fast in Nicaragua under the, some of the current laws and infrastructure. So in monitoring and evaluations and learning, Paul says that the Project Team 1 on Adolescent Pregnancy Research Agenda has conducted a team meeting and is in the process of creating a research plan around that. And Sharifa, who's on the Project 2 of the Adolescent Research Agenda, has started searching for interventions which mitigate adolescent pregnancy. DFD and NFN wants a summary discussing the key interventions relating to this and what current evidence is available to tell us about the success of these interventions in this area. Mike? Generally, uh, I had my wallet and phone stolen last week, so that kind of kicked me in the teeth. Uh, and I've been recovering for a while, so I want to apologize personally for uh, kind of checking out. I was close to burnout before, and I think that just pushed me over the edge a little bit, so... Uh, to everyone that I didn't come through for lately, uh, sorry, and I will do better. In strategic operations, this includes HR, finance, and legal. We are hiring tons of positions, most notably accountants, to help us organize our books. So excited about that. Should be completed very soon. Mm. In legal, uh, we're working on contract updates for our partner organizations when we're down in Nicaragua in July. And hopefully by the next upcast... We're going to have an IT person to help with our web presence, databases, and all sorts of other various technical issues that we just don't know how to handle. Yes, that's going to be good. So over in outreach, this includes communications, events, and community groups. Uh, the university students over at UTSC, maybe you didn't know we had a student club at UTSC, um, but uh, I've been very busy at work now, and their exams are over. They're laying the foundations for September. They're going to have a large presence on campus and recruit way more students to come onto the team. Mm. And on that, Mike, I just want to weigh in with our Nurses for Nurses community. 
So the next nursing meeting is this coming Tuesday. That's May 17th, 7.30 p.m. online or phone in. Now, there we will handle organizational business for the first 30 minutes and then discuss organizational business for the first 30 minutes, sorry. Uh, and, then, and then discuss international development It's afterwards. much more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> so if you are a nurse, please come out to this online meeting and uh, just take a peek on the nursing Slack channel for more details if you need them. In communications, Jalal, the director of outreach, has been working tirelessly to finish the job descriptions for all the roles uh, that we will be hiring in communications. Lots of those coming through the pipeline. Special thanks to Amanda for her support on that as well. And um, we should start over, uh, start our search for the communications team very soon. In fundraising development, uh, this includes fundraising and grants. Uh, fundraising is searching for amazing people to add to the team. Do you know amazing people? Send them our way. Uh, and also, there is a big push now to find uh, funding for the Nicaragua trip. Uh, so fingers crossed, we can actually get some dinero uh, to support our travel costs down there. On the grants team, everyone will be meeting soon with Bo to ensure that the grants workflow is perfectly in line with all of PAPAR. So uh, we feel that this is essential. I mean, how can we start applying for grants without being in line with programs, policy, and applied research? Um, and we really need to be fully aware of what is needed on our program side. So thank you to everyone in PAPAR right now who's helping out the grants team getting them oriented, letting them know a little bit more about each of your departments. It's certainly appreciated. And Mike, did you know that one of our volunteers' children personally fundraised $50 for us by collecting coins from his grade school class? I did know that. You actually, you told me that earlier. Yeah, but I just think it's great for so many reasons. So uh, I guess I just wanted to say thank you, Carol and family, for this great work. Uh, and honestly, any work that brings in money is greatly appreciated. So appreciated. And over to Andrew for his founder's update. Well, I've been as busy as a bee recently with my practice right next to the office over on Church Street. So healthcare-wise, I'm good. And with the DFD and NFN uh, nursing community, I'm really excited that it's forming right under our noses. And I know that we've been getting many great applicants to join the team, and I've met with them. Uh, and I'm excited to bring them, bring them on and bring them in. Welcome to the nurses. It's Tau time. Many of you have never been to a TAO, that's Tear Apart the Organization, organization um, T-A-O, uh, before, and I would like to shed some light on what that is. Uh, well, it's a, it's a space where, for the first half, we break down the organization, or tear it down, uh, into current biggest problems, uh, what we see, what we have to deal with, uh, what's bothering us, uh, what do we observe as being inefficient, what just downright sucks and doesn't match our values. Uh, you just want to complain and hang out while complaining. Uh, that's a great space to come do on, that. Come on down. Come on down to the Dow. Uh, the second half of the meeting, and this is where some of you complainers might not, uh, might not jive, so we just want to be straight up front right away. We're going to serve some food and wine at that point uh, and then develop some solutions to those problems. So first half, complain. Second half, find some solutions. Sometimes this looks like many small solutions. Sometimes it's one big thing that we're going to change. So an important takeaway from our last Tau was actually that we needed to overhaul human resources, and then we did. And now HR is flying along, and it's much improved uh, since uh, about six months ago. Six to eight months ago is when we had our last Tau. So these events are essential. If you can come out, please work with us to make things the best they can be uh, in our organization. Hmm. Thanks, Mike. And for our main story tonight, let's chat about some important and confusing actions that we, the managers, have dealt with in the past few months. And this comes from feedback from many important volunteers and managers themselves and has been building for a while, so I'd definitely like to shed some light on this. Now, Mike, what feedback have you heard recently from within the organization? I've heard that we're making decisions without consulting people. Uh, there's a breakdown of communication. There's not enough knowledge platforms to foster knowledge transfer between people. Um, also that uh, knowledge is really carried by only a few people like me and you um, and mm. we really need to solidify uh, and then write down our plans before we grow too much so we limit our risk uh, and risk exposure uh, I've also heard that we need to get the whole organization back in line with why we exist which is PAPAR which is the programs that we're doing um, and the, the people that we're trying to serve yeah thanks for that um I know also that, that Bo has heard some great feedback as well. 
and uh, things around that we're not truly things around that we're not truly utilizing our team's potential by being too involved as micromanagers, uh, or that we're aligning ourselves in a different direction from what we actually present with DFD and NFN. And this stuff I'd really like to discuss more. And, and I know for starters that I think this will come up in the, the Terra part the organization, or at least I hope it does. And that meeting's coming up on May 22nd. Um, and we'll definitely discuss a little bit more of the particulars there. Um, and so I don't want get to get into it too much now. But I will speak now to what I do know, which is that I think, uh, I think we have been and still are currently slow to adapt to our team's growth. And I can see it right now on a few important angles. So the first one is that when we implement a new policy or procedure, that it takes too long for us to actually follow it, um, anywhere from weeks to months. And this creates a gap in our values and our actions. And this, I am hoping, will change over time as we get out of the mindset of this startup organization and more into the mindset that we are a professional charity um, and important stuff needs to get done to help the people that we want to help so no one's time is wasted. And the second way I can also see this right now is uh, when volunteer managers see a discord with what we're asking for them as managers and our values and delegation of tasks and what our actions actually are. And from a few people that I've spoken to, this has really left a bad taste in their mouths. And once communication opens up again, uh, it's always fine. But uh, without that, it does really seem to turn people off. So ultimately, this change will take a long time. And I know because it stems from so many different issues, uh, from internal communications, delegation and management, uh, policies around the order and structure of things, misunderstandings of what each one of us actually does within DFD and NFN, and even our governance and our meeting structures tie into this. Uh, it is huge, and so it will take some time and patience and reminders from trusted volunteers and managers that things need to get better. Uh, but this is exactly how growth happens, and that is what I am excited for. We are moving forward by continuing to be open to input from the whole team, working harder to empower managers, and establishing clearer procedures and boundaries of responsibility so we can work more effectively as a team. If you thought that that last sentence was really smart, uh, it was because Bo said it. And Damn then, it. And then Andrew. <laughs> you weren't supposed stole, to tell. Stole it. Uh, so I can think I can speak for all of the executive council, especially Bo, when I say we do really, really want to hand off large parts of our roles to people who are better than us at them. Uh, we love the level of professionalism running in the organization and are very excited to see it grow more and see it grow better. Uh, and ultimately, thank you for your patience to all of the volunteers, um, mm -hmm. especially the managers, while we pull this thing together. Um, we all know that it's tricky um, and it's hard. There's lots of work to do. Um, and we want to get a point in the right direction. Uh, it's important to note, though, um, and I was speaking with Andrew earlier about this, that we these problems won't get solved by Andrew, Bo, and myself. Um, it requires everyone showing up and taking charge and pointing out the flaws and then finding solutions to them. Uh, really a special thanks to Paul over in England, yeah. who over the last um, few weeks has shown up big time, um, had conversations, pushed on things, pointed out the flaws, and then is fighting hard to find solutions. And that's, that's shifting our organizational management fundamentally. Uh, and it's really important um, that people show up and, and do this. So we hope that really everyone in the organization can walk together in solidarity to make this organization the best it can be. So mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Paul. Reminders for the week. We do have a Tear Apart the Organization, or TAO, coming up on May 22nd from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. at 545 Sherburn Street, so please come on out. We will have our Executive Council meeting uh, for the whole organization on Sunday, June 5th at 4 p.m. at our office. Uh, and stay tuned for our Nicaragua trip from July 1st to 10th. With the planning getting underway, we are all super excited. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. This is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. Bye. Bye. You're listening to Development Works. Produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Hello friends, I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works for June 15th, 2016. And on today's upcast... Holy Tawabunga Batman! <laughs> Uh, we recently held our third Tau and Tau Solutions meeting, and uh, the Tau meeting is, uh, for those who don't know, the Tear Apart the Organization meeting. More on that to come with a summary of big changes coming up. 
and our trip to Nicaragua. So we do have our annual trip coming up and we are getting ready for takeoff. This is mostly to collect content for fundraising because we are going to work as hard as we can to sponsor Brandon in medical school for 2017. Whoop. Updates for the week. And over in programs, policy and applied research. So the programs team is getting started up again and pulling together some important contracts for us to get signed soon in Nicaragua. Once our charitable status gets approved, our contracts, of course, inevitably with GPN will expire. And because we want to get ahead of the curve here, we are getting them signed in person preemptively, which I am proud to say. Awesome. And in data sciences, Renita is continuing to write descriptions and research proposals of projects that each data science team member is working on. So thank you very much for that. And she is also very slowly passing on her role in the coming months as she steps into other projects. So thank you, Renita, so much for planning so far ahead. Uh, it really pulls together our team a lot. And in monitoring, evaluations, and learning, Paul is re-engaging with the adolescent pregnancy research team and pulling that together. And also, Paul is setting up a research coordinator to assist Nurses for Nurses named Mariam. And welcome to the team, Mariam. Mike here, the Director of Canadian Operations. So generally, in uh, operations, we're trying to be more intentional about everything we do. So we are writing all sorts of plans, including one for HR, uh, which is slowing some things down, but really it's for the best. So in strategic operations, this includes HR, finance, and legal. And now to be featured, the IT department. Oh, God, yes. So it uh, looks like there's a, a number of candidates lined up for hire in the next two weeks, all sorts of different roles. But the, speaking particularly of IT, um, we are this close to hiring a new position. And you can't see my hand, but it's, the fingers are very close. They're together. very close, people. Very close. Very um, tiny space. So information technology is going to be a new thing. Um, and if you're listening to this and thinking my DFD email isn't working, or I wish I could collect data from our website, or what's that latest cool tool that Mike might uh, make my job easier, well, fret no more. Your IT support will be arriving soon. Over in outreach, uh, this includes communications events and community groups. Uh, the university students over at UTSC are setting up a big event for the fall right after Clubs Week. Should be exciting for all the pre-med students at U of T, aka everyone in science at U of T, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the nursing community uh, continues to grow and uh, everyone is super excited for the event coming up uh, this Saturday, actually, June 18th. It's a pool tournament at Rivoli, uh, downtown. Uh, by the way, Andrew, um, when's the next NFN meeting? The next NFN meeting is Monday, June 20th, and it's a call-in at 7.30 p.m. So for all you uh, nurses out there in Radio Land, uh, June 20th, 7.30. Uh, in communications, uh, Jalal, the director of outreach, is waiting for some sweet applications to come in uh, for a number of key roles. Uh, but in the meantime, Talini continues to throw down posts in epic fashion uh, on our social media. So thanks so much. Uh, fundraising development. This includes fundraising and grants. Uh, fundraising has its first basic team of people set up uh, now. So business contacts uh, are being um, put into our database and we're calling them. Uh, special thanks to Christine, uh, who we hear is doing a great job in finding uh, contacts. So thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, and on the grants team, uh, Melina, Will, and Adil all met with Bo finally to lay out the groundwork for our grants, uh, grants work in the future. We're excited to get a number of applications out ASAP. And over to Andrew for his founders update. Remember when we wrote Tallini a song? Oops. Anyway. Um, Fantastic. Well, well, so much change coming up. Uh, I'm honestly more more than excited to debrief the Tao with everyone today. But uh, honestly, as well, what's really motivating me these days is getting Brandon sponsored in medical school for 2017. And to me, this is why myself and, and any of us are doing any of this. Uh, it's to get money and send it to great young leaders who need it at a pivotal time in their lives in Nicaragua. So, Brandon for 2017, folks. Brandon for 2017. Uh, his picture's on my wall, actually, and I'm excited for fundraising as soon as we get back and put together a campaign and plan for the fall of 2016. So, I want us all to hit a minimum of $30,000 Canadian for Brandon by the end of this year, and I know we can do it because that'll put him in school for 2017. Brandon, 2017. And for our main story tonight, what we learned from the Tau, the Tear Apart the Organization. So again, for some context, this is our third Tau. And after every Tau, we've, we've had some major shifts in priorities as an organization. 
This keeps us on the same page and pointed in the right direction. So we sat down for a few hours and complained about the things that could be run better. And the directors pulled those together. And with the help of some of the managers when needed, we put together a hefty solutions document and presented it to volunteers a few weeks later in the solutions meeting. Uh, and now straight into it, uh, the complaints and solutions from town number three. So uh, first, the directors all got called on some of our bullshit, uh, which is always healthy. So, for example, uh, I, Mike, can be an ass asshole sometimes. Uh, so my bad on that. Uh, I'm going to try to cut down on that. And uh, one suggestion was even that I use more emoticons. Um, I don't understand them. Uh, but I guess I will try. Just keep sending winks. I think that's how it works. Winky faces all over the place. You're going to creep out so many people. Hey, can you do this thing? Wink. Weird. Um, Andrew uh, was told to stop, stop doing random things without asking people uh, first. So shame, Andrew. Uh, but, you know, less shame now because you'll fix it. Uh, and Bo was told to speak more to people uh, he works with. So uh, all that and more coming from the town. And second, so here are some things that are organizational problems and their solutions. Now, one of them was we weren't tapping into the broad skill sets of our beautiful volunteers. And now we're going to get HR to track people's skills. So if something comes up and we need a Swedish masseuse, let's say. What well, don't you need a Swedish masseuse for? Well, we know that Ryan in New York actually has professional training as a Swedish masseuse. So... You know, instead of hiring a separate volunteer f to be a Swedish masseuse, we can actually just post that job internally and Ryan would apply for it. And it'd be for great. the Swedish masseuse role. That's just an example. Yeah. Uh, generally, a problem, another problem that we have is that we're losing focus uh, because all of our ambition and uh, the breadth of activities that we undergo, uh, like Swedish, Swedish massage um, college here. Uh, so now we are actually realigning behind the organizational priority of Brandon uh, and our next student, uh, Brandon, uh, that we want to send to medical school will be going in 2017 and that's our new slope. Yeah. I think really if we're doing things in the organization that don't support him going to medical school in 2017, then we're just not doing it right. I wonder if Brandon could go to Swedish Massage College. A terrible charitable organization. Yeah, I don't <laughs> support that. Now, <laughs> super popular in Sweden. <laughs> And now one solution that ticks off a lot of solution boxes uh, is actually our new proposal strategy. So essentially, if anyone wants to make any substantial changes to the organization, making new partnerships or spending new money or, or time or on a new idea, hiring someone, whatever, uh, they'll have to create a proposal and submit it to the whole organization for review. So similar to how every volunteer needs a job description to be brought into the team, every project that we are working on needs a proposal to have resources dedicated to it, which is essentially just the who, what, where, why, when, and how of a project. So yes, we are putting more critical thought into things before we start working on it in all areas of the organization. And as simple as this sounds, we just weren't doing it before. And one part of the organization didn't really know what the other parts are doing. And personally, why they were doing it um, was a huge issue. So we had parts of the organization that uh, we're doing really important things, but nobody understood why they did it. And so they weren't in full support. And I think it created a lot of disenchantment amongst certain volunteers, especially that didn't understand the reasons behind why we were doing things. We were, so, we were messing up. So this is now solved because we need to increase the communication around this. And this ties into that as well. Now, the big solution uh, is around our communications. Uh, we're bringing everyone into the same Slack system. Uh, that way we can increase interdepartmental communications. Um, all you folks in research, finally going to meet some fundraisers. We're all looking forward to that. And another problem here was that the executive committee meetings were kind of shitty and boring, and they, they didn't really pull out the right people to make the really hard decisions that we, that we needed to make. So we're changing that, and, and formal business will now be online where everyone can be on their own timeline and can vote as they, as they so choose. Um, and in-person monthly meetings are going to be way more fun and discussion-based. Uh, and lastly, I do have to personally say congratulations to Rodrigo and Programs because he won the award for best complaint in the organization. Uh, now for this, he won a, uh, a very brand new DFD and NFN branded rock. Uh, and more specifically, it's called the My Complaint Rocks Award. So congratulations again, Rodrigo, for that. That's clever. Did you think about that all by yourself? 
Reminders for the week. Nurses for Nurses is throwing a pool tournament fundraiser this weekend. Can you uh, use an emoticon so that didn't <laughs> seem like you were being a Wink. Dick? Okay, now that's <laughs> fine. Now that's fine. Let's move this move on. Damn it. I'm learning slowly. Uh, reminders. Uh, NFN, throwing a pool tournament. It's going to be super fun. Uh, June 18th in Toronto, downtown. Starts up at 6 p.m. Come out this Saturday. Lots of prizes to be won. Should be absolutely spectacular. Uh, and check out our Facebook for more info. Uh, and uh, we also have our executive council meeting for the whole organization on June 26th at 4 p.m. But don't forget, the meetings are now different. They're less boring. You're going to have fun. There's going to be like fireworks and tigers and like a trapeze. I and think. Swedish masseuse. <laughs> <laughs> Swedish masseuse. Uh, sure. Introducing some new volunteers. So Kelsey and Christine in fundraising uh, who are making a huge difference already. So... We're now making calls with our formal team, and I have to say, I feel like we're cruising compared to where we were before. So um, thank you very much for, for coming on the team. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. And this is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. Like the problems that Swedish massage masseuses masseuse work on. Good mistakes, yeah. <laughs>
Um, and if you don't know where to start for hiring, then please get in touch with me or Ed. Uh, there's been a lot of confusion about the process um, to hire. We aren't going to track you down and show you the process. Uh, the onus is really on you to come find us and ask. So please, uh, let's get in contact and let's uh, help you build your team. Over in accounting, uh, we've now hired a financial systems advisor, and his name is Slava. So Slava comes with the perfect combo of business, accounting, and strategy experiences. Uh, so we are going to have our finances in order ASAP, uh, and especially with the, the charitable status coming up uh, pretty soon. That's really important. Thank you, Slava. Uh, and over in outreach, uh, this includes communications, events, community groups. Uh, the nursing community is really rallying around Kathy, who was down in Nicaragua recently, uh, who's made important connections um, in Nicaragua on that trip. Uh, and really the first programs um, involving nurses are on the horizon uh, and they'll be coming out shortly, which is super exciting. In events, we have two new volunteers, Crystal and Jacqueline, uh, who are working with everyone in the organization to design our event strategy over the next few months uh, and designing it in tandem with our crowdfunding campaign in November. Again, everything kind of focusing and funneling behind that. And over in communications, we've had one of our longest serving volunteers, Talini, uh, move on from her role as social media and posting guru. I think guru is the official title. Um, and uh, we can't say enough about her. So, uh, Talini, just thank you so much for all your work, um, for building such solid foundations in our social media, um, for the whole organization, Twitter, Facebook, whatever else you were posting on. And Talini, I know you can't see me here, but I just bowed. Mm -hmm. He did. He did actually bow. I will confirm. Uh, over in fundraising development, uh, this includes fundraising and grants. Uh, our fundraising team is preparing for the fall crowdfunding campaign, everything being put into that. So Tay, Michelle, Christine um, have been all doing amazing work, and I really look forward to seeing what they can come to, um, come to the table with in November. Uh, and on the grants team, uh, Melina, Will, and Adil are actually meeting regularly, which is amazing, and are starting to prioritize a grants list and put together applications. So it's only really a matter of time before we're given, I'm sure, millions of dollars with no strings attached. So thanks uh, so much to the grants team for putting that together. And over to Andrew for his founders update. Well, Mike, with two new potential students on the horizon, we got Brandon and Cindy, as well as securing funding for our original two students, Brian and Kimberly. There's certainly a lot for me to be excited about. I'm spending a lot of my time covering my tracks from Nicaragua, and this includes things like thank you emails to the people we met with, staying in touch with students and partners and ensuring that the new plans get put into place. And this is what's consuming my time now. And honestly, it's what I love doing more than anything else. So I'm as happy as a bug in a rug. It's a busy, busy bug in a rug. And for our main story tonight, Nicaragua. We went there. You probably knew. Um, so Andrew, what actually happened in Nicaragua? Well, I know we previously mentioned that we all got back safely from the safest country in Central America, so there's not really a large surprise there. It's still a nice thing to say, hence, nice thing to hear. Hence the name. Yeah. Um, on day one, we traveled to the island of Omotepe, which is an island formed by two big and beautiful volcanoes. Omotepe. <laughs> we went out for dinner, and we ended up seeing the movie Titanic in Spanish by accident, and we were just mesmerized. Uh, on day two, we hiked a volcano together, and it took... 11 hours and just about killed me. Um, I, uh, we had to eat a lot of food uh, to get there and fuel up, drink a lot of water. Um, we had to fight some monkeys off. Uh, and that night there was a party on the island um, that broke out uh, and ended in a horse show. Um, that's right, horses. So we got a great video of that. And on day three, uh, Monday was our first day of actually getting to the important stuff. We went to visit our local partners in the foundation of Jean Brueger in San Juan del Sur. And after this, Julia and I took the students, Brian and Kimberly, and their families uh, for a dinner just to thank you for their continued hard work and support. Uh, we shared funny medical stories, and one of which involved Brian delivering a baby and his senior doctor cutting an umbilical cord too early, giving Brian a face full of blood. Uh, so that was certainly a highlight of the evening. Mm -hmm. Gross, uh, and hopefully not transmitting of hepatitis. Uh, on the fourth day in San Juan del Sur, uh, we visited the health clinic of the area. Uh, and so Kathy, uh, the nurse that was down with us, got a lot of important info for just building future nursing collaborative programs, meeting people, chatting with people, building relationships. Uh, we then traveled to Ostianel, which is in the, the far south of Nicaragua, 
um, to visit uh, Brandon and his family. We collected great information that put us in a really good place to really support Bra uh, Brandon with a crowdfunding campaign in November. Uh, we need to raise $30,000 for him. We made that clear with him, and uh, we're going to get him covered for medical school. And on day five in San Mendel Sur again, we interviewed Kimberly for the Spark of Hope Foundation. They had an application we needed her to fill out to get her some good funding. And then the team traveled to Managua, the big city, the main city in Nicaragua, for the evening where we interviewed our potential fourth student, Cindy. So we also hooked Kathy up with some head nurses of the public university, UNAN, and I met with the dean of that school and made some important research contacts for Bo and the research team. On day six, uh, that's Thursday, uh, Kathy, Tay, Julia, and Michelle stayed back in Managua to go back to UNAN uh, and finish some of the interviews with nurses. Uh, and Andrew and myself uh, had a great translator, Ashley, that we had a connection with through Toronto. Um, and uh, we headed up to Esquipulas in the north of Nicaragua to check out the radio health program. And that was to meet with our local partners, CM ADEM, uh, two women by the name of Sandra and Marta. Uh, so it was a fantastic evening. We spoke so much. We had about a three hour meeting. Um, and we came to the conclusion at the end uh, that CM ADEM uh, will no longer be continuing to support the radio health program. Uh, they've had some difficulties. And just after. Uh, after we chatted with them, it became clear um, that we should be moving in the direction of um, running it through our students. So when we clear it with our funders, we're going to be sending uh, money to um, our students so that it can be recorded and played in rural areas for a while to come. Uh, and this was a, a really big night and a change in direction. And on day seven, Mike, myself, and our fast, uh, fantastic translator Ashley interviewed a potential future student from a very rural area named Jessica also with the Spark of Hope Foundation in mind. And then we headed back to Managua for a meetup with the rest of the team and a debrief. And Mike, if I remember correctly, this was also the night where we ended up staying up until about 2 a.m. in a hostel working and recording videos that we just got organized. We did, in fact, do that. It ended in a dance party because I think we were delirious. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, the eighth day, the last day, Saturday, uh, we all met up at Casa Canadiense, a great partner organization uh, with a safe space to put your head down in Managua. Uh, and we prepared for our departure, uh, trying to pack up all the random stuff that we bought. Uh, and then we decided to throw a party for all our new local contacts and friends. Uh, we went out dancing, actually, in the big city of Managua. It was a blast. Uh, thank you so much to Ashley, to Juan Carlos, to Hermie uh, for ensuring the, the group's safety, uh, you know, looking after us gringos. Uh, and that was uh, certainly amazing. And the Spanish phrase of the day is, Claro, que sí, si, meaning, yes, of course. And you'll always hear this being yelled back and forth while waiting in a tightly packed bus terminal in Nicaragua. Right, Mike? Claro, que sí. Si. He catches on quickly. So reminders for the week. The Spark of Hope applications uh, are coming together really well. So through this, the, through this foundation, we hope to get Kimberly and Cindy sponsored, our two strong female students on the ground in Nicaragua. Uh, our charitable status is coming through very soon. Uh, it should be in September, October, somewhere in there. And that means we're going to be breaking away from GPN, our parent charity. We're so excited about this. So many things are going to be moving forward. We're going to apply for charitable status in the U.S. We'll be able to apply for grants there. Um, there's lots of departments, legal, financial, comms, events, all. Everyone's going to um, be rallying around this. So look out for the big party when we do get our own charitable number. And our student group, our University of Toronto Scarborough campus, has enrollment and student sign-up coming up in September. So let's make this the best frosh ever for DFD and NFN. And reminder that we don't have executive council meetings anymore. We are focusing this time on social events and more things like brainstorming sessions to use everyone's time the most effectively. Now our higher level executive decisions are now made over Slack, where proposals are submitted and decisions can be made more thoroughly and importantly, more inclusively. So our next big in-person get together is August 18th and more details to come out soon on that. Yeah, it's gonna be a party and uh, debrief a lot of the different things. And finally, uh, there is a crowdfunding campaign coming up in November, if you haven't already heard. Uh, it'll be sometime in the first few weeks of November. Uh, we're going to be really uh, outreaching to everybody in our community that's connected to DFD NFN to support this, to really raise $30,000 collectively to send our student Brandon to school. Uh, so that's the hope. 
And introducing new volunteers, thank you Slava as our new accountant, and I'm sure Mike is currently dying with happiness from this. Yep, things I don't have to do anymore. Thank you so much, Slava. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. And this is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you don't make mistakes, if you don't, if you don't make mistakes, 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 you're not if you don't working, make mistakes. you're not working on hard enough problems. problems. <sighs> Sorry. Listening to Development Works, produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Hello, friends. I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works for September 6th, 2016. And on today's Upcast... This is our last private Upcast, our last transmission before we get our CRA status and go public with these things that we call Upcasts. So this means that excitement is in the air. I can smell it. Because this is the last upcast we can get away with seeing all sorts of bad words. Whoa, 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 Mike. My grandma listens to this. Well, then I'll try to be more appropriate and we'll have to be fucking polite. The Research Ethics Board, or the REB, is almost fully together. For those of you who haven't heard the good news, Julia and Programs Policy and Applied Research have been doing great work to fit together a Research Ethics Board. So more on that to come. Updates for the week. Nova and Programs, Policy, and Applied Research. So the Programs team has outlined possible options, and Mike is speaking with the granting organizations about approving the future of the Radio Health Program. Yes, you heard it right, we're still doing the RHP. If funder requests fall outside of these options, then we will renegotiate our grants for the program. So in other words, we're solidifying the Radio Health Program budget with our funders, and on this we are currently asking our funders for a slight change in the direction of the funds. This is important before we spend any money on the ground, because if any part of the plan deviates from the original grant proposals that funding was given for, we must update the funders on the change of the plans with the slight risk of them saying no and pulling back the funding. So we want to make sure that all of our grant funders are happy with the program as it stands. Over in data sciences, currently it's actually on hold. So we're awaiting a new leader, meaning that current projects are saved and ready to go when we pick back up. And over in Monitoring, Evaluations, and Learning, or the MEL team, Mariam is in charge of working with the nursing team and is the guiding force of ideas around the nursing community. So she's been, lot, she's been doing a lot of great work with Kathy, who's our lead nurse, and the MEL team. And we're turning some of those good ideas into good plans with everyone's help. Uh, so thank you very much for everyone who's working on that. Mike here, the Director of Canadian Operations. So generally, ops is in hiring mode, and we are restructuring our teams to make sure everything is more efficient. Uh, over in strategic operations, this includes HR, finance, legal, and IT. The HR team is fantastic as always, and if anyone in the organization needs to hire, please contact myself or Ed. He's the HR manager. We'd be happy to walk you through the process. I always say the more volunteers, the better. And even though several people may disagree with me about this, I stick to my guns. More volunteers, the better. Over in IT, we're finally bringing on our new IT personnel, Felucio and Alberto, uh, who are taking, on, uh, taking off on various tasks to help us find new web hosting or better online communication tools or so much more. So if your team is looking for some technology advice, please let me know. We'll put you in touch with our IT specialists. In legal, uh, we're trying to find a suitable candidate for the co-director position. Uh, and we're always looking for good lawyers to get involved with their cause. So we have lots of legal questions from contracts to international business law. So if you know a lawyer that wants to volunteer, please send them our way. Over in outreach, this includes communications, events, and community groups. Kathy continues to work with research to find specific projects for the nursing team that they'll be able to sink their teeth into. And details should be coming out shortly. Over in events, we ran an event two weeks ago that brought out almost 20 people. It was great to talk about the trip this summer to Nicaragua. And we got lots of great feedback, too, even uh, from some new faces at the event. So that's exciting. And over in fundraising development, this includes fundraising and grants. Michelle has taken lead on our crowdfunding campaign coming up in November. And we're really excited for her leadership. She is recruiting more volunteers to help with our campaign to raise $30,000 for Brandon in November. We're yes, yes, y'all. 
And on the grants team, Melina Will and Adil have put together a stellar application for OSSTF, the Ontario Secondary School Teacher Federation. Who knew they give out money uh, to projects like ours, but they do. And we're applying for $3,000 towards funding the half of Kimberly we haven't funded yet. So thanks to that team for their work. And over to Andrew for his Founders Update. Well, thank you for asking, Mike. I'm actually doing pretty darn good. Uh, things are coming together right now from all angles, and I think the charity overall is doing uh, better than it's ever been doing. So Gabriella, also known as Gabs, um, one short thing here, who's been working very closely with me and the exec team over the past year now, is actually off to school, and so I think I can speak for everyone when we say that we definitely wish her well. Bon voyage. And upon a little bit of reflection here, it was really great to just have gone down to Nicaragua this past summer um, with volunteers that working at such a high level. So I'm really happy about that too. Um, and lastly, we have plans now for funding to cover each of the students. And this is something that I've always dreamt of deep inside of my psyche um, for Brian, for Kimberly, for Cindy, and for Brandon. And we're working with the team to make sure those plans come to fruition. So I am very excited about that. And for our main story tonight, the Research Ethics Board, otherwise known as the REB. So the Research Ethics Board is a volunteer board comprised of two researchers, a lawyer, an ethicist, and a member of the community being researched. And they all walk into a bar, right? <laughs> and then the, the joke... No, keep going. Okay, so the community leader being researched in our case is specifically someone from Nicaragua. Now, they each provide a unique perspective on the ethical conduct of research and are the required roles under the Tri-Council Policy Statement 2. Their role as a board is to provide ethical oversight of the research operations of programs, policy, and applied research, ensuring that research partic participants are well treated and not exposed to any unnecessary harm. All research must go through this board for approval, and they will operate autonomously, but they're also a part of DFD and NFM. Now, this board is based in Canada and chaired... <laughs> A light just fell. Let's keep rolling. Yeah. And chaired by one of the researchers. So the board was assembled by Julia through interviews a couple of months ago now. So to back up for a sec and fix our light that fell, uh, in Canada there are many types of research ethics boards that approve applications for all sorts of research projects. The most common document or set of laws that Canadian universities follow is the Tri-Council Policy Statement. Kind of sounds like a world government organization. Uh, not evil in this case. However, uh, there are all types of documents geared towards different educational aspects, such as biology, clinical practices, biotech, stem cells, whatever you got. So the Tri-Council is actually one of the top three government granting agencies in Canada as well. Uh, and if one wants to do research in Canada, and one wants to apply for funds, their project would have to be approved by the Tri-Council. So having a research ethics board actually provides us with an additional safeguard for protecting the people we're working with and who wish to participate in our research in Nicaragua. It provides uncompromised ethical guidance and support for our researchers. It allows for a greater range of publication options, which increases access to quality Nicaraguan health literature and for other organizations, um, and Nicaraguans even, so that they make informed decisions and we can all work collaboratively for greater health for all Nicaraguans. Now, lastly, it increases the overall quality of our research. And in short, Bo puts it best, good ethics is good research. I want that on a t-shirt. And now, on to less important things. The Spanish phrase of the day today is, Yo no creo en santos que orinan. Meaning, of course, I do not believe in saints that urinate. And this is for that time when someone you know or see looks like a saint, but you don't believe that they are actually trustworthy. I guess it's because they're urinating. Uh, I think it's urinating is basically lying. Translations, they're hard. But exactly, Andrew. I'm glad you brought that up because we get our charitable status soon. And when we do, uh, we would have to submit changes to our organizational purpose for a total of $200 each time we want to investigate something new. So, uh, such as saints urinating, is there anything else that we'd want to talk about before we get our own charitable status, Andrew? Nothing that I can think of for the application, but I think it is starting to become apparent to me that the CRA is one of those saints that has been peeing all over us from day one. <laughs> we'll debate whether or not we cut that later. 
Uh, and reminders for the week. Charitable status acceptance is coming through soon. Fingers crossed. Toes are crossed. We're going to break away from GPN, Global Peace Network. Uh, we've been saying this for a year. It's going to happen. It's got to happen eventually, right? On an infinite timeline. Right, Andrew? Right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 Um, so we're also going to apply for charitable status in the U.S. Right after happens. Mike's release. Yeah. Now, a student group sign up and enrollment in September is also going to be happening. In, and of course, I'm talking about the student group of the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Let's make this the best frosh ever with frosh, DFD woo! and NFA. <laughs> um, <laughs> reminder that we don't have executive council meetings anymore. We are focusing this time on social events and brainstorming sessions. Uh, so at higher, our higher level executive decisions are now made over Slack online, uh, and that's where decisions can be made more thoroughly and inclusively. I couldn't get the vision of a keg stand for DFD and NFN out of my head. Never going to happen. Never. Now introducing new volunteers, Felucio and Alberto in the IT department. Mike, what does IT actually mean? Information technology. Mike is very happy with this, of course. Super happy. And welcome to Vicky and Human Resources. And that's everything for this week's episode of Development Works. Thanks for listening. This is Andrew and Mike signing off. And remember, if you make mistakes, you're working on hard enough problems. I think that's how it works. Why do double negatives always sound wiser? I think the answer is not unknown. That's clever.